vanilla, the world's most ubiquitous flavor, so ever-present that today calling something vanilla connotes blandness and simplicity. It's everywhere from our pastries to our perfume and sometimes even our clothing. But it wasn't always like that. In fact, for quite some time, vanilla was Europe's most exotic import. The rare plant coming from Mexico was so hard to cultivate, it's surprising we even know what it tastes like today. Luckily for us, and the story of creativity, most of the past few years have been dedicated to the cultivation of this plant. When conquistadors first tasted the plant, they brought it back to Europe, where chefs, nobility, and perfume makers alike demanded more. However, due to the troublesome nature of vanilla's cultivation, Europeans had to embark on a journey through scientific discovery and forced labor. But, most of all, creativity. Now, for years, no one could find the solution to vanilla's cultivation until Edmund Albius. Now, Albius wasn't a scientist, nor was he well-educated. In fact, he didn't even have the right to his own freedom. As a slave, Albius learned everything he knew about creativity through trial and error. Failure after failure, he learned that the vanilla plant could only be pollinated by hand. And at just 12 years old, he kick-started what today is a billion-dollar industry. Around the same time, a scientist in Belgium by the name of Charles Morin came to a similar conclusion. He realized that a species of bees in Mexico pollinated the plant in a similar way to that which Albius would. Two different people, living in vastly different circumstances, used different methods, but came to the same conclusion. This tells us that creative success isn't a characteristic only present in a select few, but rather in everybody. Albius didn't have a moment of greatness, nor did Charles Morin. Both of them went through trial, error, and discovery to come to their respective conclusions. Creating isn't extraordinary. Yes, sometimes the results may be, but to create is to be human. It's in everyone. Now, this word creativity, the literal definition, is the use of imagination or new ideas to create something. But I disagree with that. I think that it perpetuates the already existing myth that creativity is a short process. One person, usually a man, has a million dollar idea and a spark of brilliance. When in reality, creativity is long and convoluted and can really only be defined by rejection. The only way to avoid rejection is not create anything new. Creativity is a maze, and sometimes the only way to move forward is to move backwards. You have to rethink and reevaluate, find what's wrong and fix it, because you can't go through a maze with only moving forward. Most of the times, the exit's already behind you. This mindset will allow us to understand that creation is the destination, but creativity, the ordinary act. So we all know that creativity comes in various shapes and sizes, but whatever the medium, creation is an incredibly powerful tool. Over winter break, I worked as an intern at a startup company which developed modular smartwatches. The people there outlined what creativity meant to them, and they split it up into three tiers of creativity, the first one being to create. At its simplest form, creativity is simply creating, but it's a lot harder than it sounds, but everybody's capable. In fact, at our school, we're given plenty of opportunities to create. We write in English class. We create works of literature, robots and robotics, and so much more. But that's where it stops. We never reach the second creativity, which is work that inspires others. Now, it's a lot harder, and the creator might not know for years. In fact, Vincent van Gogh died penniless. He thought of himself as an utter failure. But now he's inspiration to artists and makers everywhere. This is evident in successful people as well. YouTubers and movie makers have been incredibly successful at inspiring the rest of our population, but we don't strive to see this at our school. This leads me to the third tier of creativity, which is work that allows others to create. Now, this is why Apple makes computers and smartwatches, and Google runs a search engine. This may come in the form of a startup weekend at our own school, or even a TEDx event much like this one. At school, we aren't challenged to reach this level of creation. If anything, we aren't even challenged to create work that inspires others. Rather, we're fixated on getting the highest grade possible and following teacher rubrics, when in reality, we should be focused on our passions and be learning from our mistakes. So let's look into why we accept this ever so obvious misconception. For years, we've lived thinking that if we create something better than we've had before, the world would give whatever it took to get their hands on such a product. 
This is why in the 1800s, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, build a better mousetrap and the world will be the path to your door. But since then, every year there have been 400 mousetrap patents, 40 of which are issued. This means that since Emerson, there have been 5,000 new mousetraps. Yet the original one outsells all its competitors two to one. This tells us that although Emerson probably didn't mean for the world to create new mousetrap after new mousetrap, the story is still telling of how we base important decisions like our education systems on information that might have been accurate years ago. Edmund Albius didn't just create a solution to properly cultivate vanilla. In fact, he was living proof, a living example that when the world doesn't be the path to your door, you have to be the path to the world. Thank you.